at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. All right, guys. Well, good morning with another Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Claire, thanks for hopping on this morning. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Claire. Well, I mean, the, the talk of the town these days is the looming debt ceiling issue. Candidly, we're recording the morning of Tuesday, May 30th. We heard over the weekend that there may or may not be a consensus or deal struck between the two parties. Um, what should we expect this week? And then what are the kind of broader uh, economic implications of the fact that it's taken this long to reach a deal? Absolutely. So firstly, the debt ceiling is a cap on the total debt that is held by the U.S. government, i.e. it's a cap on the amount of money the government, the Department of Treasury, that is, can borrow to pay the nation's bills. And these bills include Social Security and Medicare benefits, tax refunds, military salaries, et cetera. The current debt ceiling hovers around $31.4 trillion, but we already hit that borrowing limit in January. So the proposed deal from President Biden and Speaker McCarthy this past weekend, if passed, would suspend the nation's $31.4 trillion debt limit until the start of 2025. So it re would remove it as a potential issue in the upcoming 2024 presidential election. And under the proposed deal, non-defense spending would remain essentially flat in fiscal year 2024 and then increase a very modest 1% in fiscal year 2025. And essentially what's going to happen this week is that today, Tuesday, May 30th, the House Rules Committee is meeting and will either allow the deal to be um, voted on in the House tomorrow, which is widely expected as to what will happen. And then once the House votes, if they approve the deal, then the Senate will be able to cast their votes so essentially, it's looking like the timeline of this deal is such that we will very narrowly avoid the X date or the date upon which the U.S. government would no longer be able to service its debt payments. In terms of the broader economic implications, if the U.S. were to default on its debt, which is very unlikely, but if it were to happen, then it, the economic consequences would be fairly devastating. In the housing market, mortgage rates would probably surge a pretty substantial rate. Um, and we can walk through the specifics of that. The details are a little bit cumbersome, so bear with me here. But in essence, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage tracks the 10-year treasury yield and as treasuries are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, they're considered risk-free assets, and they're among the safest assets available to investors. So the yield itself is the rate of return that investors are requiring from the U.S. Treasury to, in order for the Treasury to borrow their money. So Treasury bond prices and yields are inversely correlated, so when demand for treasury bonds increases, and therefore the prices for those bonds rise, the yield declines because the government doesn't have to offer as high of a return to investors to incentivize them to purchase treasury bonds. However, when demand for treasuries dampens, and therefore the prices for treasury bonds lower, the yield increases because the government is trying to incentivize investors to purchase treasury bonds. So over the past several weeks, as we have continued to approach the X date or the date upon which the U.S. government would no longer be able to service its debt, which is currently projected to be June 5th, Monday, June 5th, demand for treasuries has broadly declined as investors are somewhat uncertain as to whether the government will be able to service its debt in the future. So this has caused the 10-year treasury yield to rise, prompting an uptick in the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, which hovered around 6.6% last week. So simply said, as the yield rises and falls, interest rates follow. Right, 
Right. Got it. And so, you know, the, I guess the implication that I, that I would just want agents to understand is that the volatility that we've experienced over the last at least really probably two weeks in earnest, both being driven by the economic reports that we've reported on, the things that are happening um, just at a, at a routine economic level, but then com compounded with this uncertainty of will the government, you know, proceed with the debt ceiling? Will they proceed with making good on their debt liabilities, et cetera, et cetera? And so that has caused a lot of volatility in the mortgage market. As we see the debt ceiling issue resolved, which I believe it will be, how quickly does the market respond to now having some level of continuity, at least on that measure moving forward? Well, that's a great question. And the answer is a little bit complicated. The reason for that being that the Fed will meet next on June 13th and 14th. There's still a little bit of uncertainty as to whether they will either pause their rate hikes or consider an additional rate hike, probably to the tune of 25 basis points. That's largely going to depend on the economic data that's coming out this week specifically the jobs report, which will be released on Friday. But depending on how much, if at all, really, the labor market has slowed, that's also going to inform the Fed's decision as to whether, again, to pause or hike rates. With respect to mortgage rates, it's likely that they'll remain somewhat elevated, probably for at least the first half of June, if not through the entire month. But again, we're expecting rates to decline modestly over the course of the year as monetary policy kind of backs off, if you will, and we don't see as high inflation. So um, as we see those two elements kind of coming into play, we should see a corresponding, again, very modest decline in the mortgage rate, probably ending the year in the high fives or low six range. Okay, great. So we should expect that next week we'll tee up that we'll talk about the jobs report. That will give some context to what we might anticipate from the Fed meeting, which will come mid-June. We might or might not see one more uptick in interest rates, and then we hope to see them sort of settle through the fall. Is That's that right. fair, fair consensus. Okay, great. Um, well, let's talk about the local market. What are we seeing in pendings? What's happening here with housing this week? Sure. So last week, sales activity slowed modestly. So pendings declined about 2% and closed sales declined 0.3%. So essentially flat. Um, I would highlight, though, that last week was somewhat of an abnormal week in the sense that, of course, we had the impending Memorial Day holidays. So that could have slowed activity somewhat in and of itself. So since last week was somewhat of an, an abnormal week, let's think about what was happening last year on a week-over-week -week basis. So last year, this same week, we saw pending sales decline about 9%, and we saw listings rise about 10%. So relative to this week last year, we performed a little bit better. Um, so there's some some good news in that, but overall, just essentially a pretty flat week. Steady for the week. Yeah. Right. Well, I know everybody will be anticipating that Fed decision and really wanting to continue to look towards what will happen with interest rates. I'll say it again, as we say almost every week, the practical reality of the Austin market is that regardless of what happens with interest rates, we continue to, to gain value, um, you know, over the long term. And it's probably cheaper to buy today than it will be tomorrow for a long time forward. So agents keep keep um, encouraging your consumers to take advantage of this marketplace and, and life in Central Texas. With that, Claire, thanks for your time today. We'll look forward to talking about the jobs report next week. We hope you have a great week. Thanks so much, guys. Take care.